Yes, I'm just making sure that we are up and running. Hello, hello, my dearest peace lovers and peacemakers. This is Sarah Jamshidi. Welcome to Peace Talk with Sarah and Goldtune YouTube channels. This uh, production is produced for Peace Mindedly podcast. So I'm sure that we are going to see you on, on Peace Mindedly. So for today, I am a, I am I am super excited because we are talking with Zahra Hankir, Lebanese. British journalist with a book that I am so eager to to discuss. So Our Women on the Ground, this is her book, Our Women on the Ground, essays by Arab women reporting from the Arab world is something I absolutely can relate. If you know me, you know that I was a foreign correspondent for a few major uh, media networks. And what Zahra is talking about and explaining in, in her book is something that I totally can relate relate to. You know, I mean, being a foreign correspondent or female reporter in, in, in the Middle East is a, is a tough job. It's a tough job and it has its own advantages and disadvantages that we are going to cover during our show with our beautiful writer. Zahra was able to gather and edit stories written by 19 Arab women journalists. In this book, you learn about these female reporters, challenges, triumphant moments and stories the way you do not see anywhere else. So I am bringing Zahra into our screen. Hello, hello. Hello, thank you so much for having me, Sarah. I'm really excited to discuss the book and to engage with your audience as well. Absolutely. It's a pleasure to have you. Zahra writes about the intersection of politics, culture, and society in the Middle East. Her work uh, has appeared in Vice, BBC, Al Jazeera, Bloomberg Business Week, and many other places. And she holds a degree in po politics and Mid Middle Eastern studies. Okay, Zahra, now we took care of uh, many of those introductions. I am just very, very curious for the, for the start. I would like to know why, why, do we say that it's a tough job to be a female reporter in Arab nations? Of course, I mean, there are many different challenges at many different levels. And oftentimes the most immediate challenges start in the home. So I don't want to um, generalize, and this is something we'll probably discuss given that there are so many countries across the Arab world and they each have their individual and unique socio economic and political dynamics, but generally many women are in conservative households and environments in which their families or their partners might not necessarily want them to be engaging in this sort of a career, particularly in countries uh, which have uh, patriarchal societies and particularly in countries where there is socioeconomic upheaval that would put the life of the, of the woman reporter at great risk as well as her own family. So sometimes that challenge starts in the home and then that extends to when you are on the street. So if you are an actual reporter on the ground, uh, you will have to be um, reporting um, on very difficult subjects and, and engaging uh, with men and you may not be uh, welcome in those spaces. There may be some restrictions on your travel. Uh, in particular, in my book, this uh, issue comes up in places like Egypt and Syria. Uh, so you may face um, sexual harassment uh, and, and other issues uh, when reporting on the ground in, you know, out in, in sort of uh, public spaces. And then um, also in the workplace, you may not be taken seriously. You may not be granted with the same opportunities as men on the same beat. Uh, you may face further sexual harassment and assault and discrimination. And then there are other broader uh, issues which have to do with the actual um, political developments in whichever country we're looking at, particularly those in which there is warfare. Uh, so you are dealing with non-state and state actors who would much rather that you not be reporting the truth, that you not be out there on the ground and doing the work that you're doing and uh, would want to repress and suppress the journalism that you're doing. So you may be uh, at risk for things like um, being detained uh, and oftentimes also death, uh, being shot at, so, uh, being assaulted. So there's so many challenges. Yeah, uh, these challenges are not particularly uh, women challenges. Men also face these kind of challenges, don't they? 
I would say that it's heightened for women, uh, particularly in male dominated spaces. Uh, as we know, uh, the region lags other regions when it comes to women's rights. So women are actually um, uh, discriminated against uh, vastly across the region. So I don't think that's something that we can uh, turn a blind eye to. We have to acknowledge that oftentimes it is more difficult to be a woman in these patriarchal uh, societies. So I would say that while men share some of the challenges, the challenges tend to be steeper for women. Absolutely. I absolutely agree. So here is, um, you are a journalist yourself, an editor. I wanted to say in, in, general t in general terms, so what is good reporting? Who is a good reporter in your opinion? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think it's someone who uh, really tries to tell the story of what they're seeing by um, speaking to not just politicians and non-state actors and the people who are really calling the shots um, when it comes to socioeconomic and political developments, but also the people who are suffering from the decisions made by those actors. So for me, I find stories that um, really speak to the suffering of people by actually hearing from those people themselves to be the most compelling stories. And I've tried to mirror that in my work, not only in this book, um, but also in my reporting, for example, on the Beirut blast. For me, I was immediately attracted to the stories of the survivors of the Beirut blast. And that's the sort of story I want to read. I want to know how these broader developments are impacting people in a very personal way. Absolutely. So in, in more personal, do you, do you have an example for us? A specific example? Um, I mean, I would say uh, I often remember Anthony Shadid, uh, his, his, uh, his wife actually has a beautiful chapter in this book, Nada Bakri, uh, and he was well known for uh, telling the stories of how people uh, in conflict endure those conflicts and how they suffer. So any of his reporting on Iraq, I think, was uh, for me uh, very, very inspirational, and I continue to return to his work as an example of how to really tell the story of a conflict through the people. Absolutely. Okay, speak. so here's the thing. You uh, can speak and understand Arabic. Anthony, I met him. He understands and speaks Arabic. Um, but what what do you believe that, for instance, a Western non-speak, non-Arabic speaker do not get about what's happening in the Arab world compared to someone like you or Anthony Shadid? Yeah. Um, I think it's really important to acknowledge, first and foremost, the role of a fixer and a stringer in these environments, because foreign correspondents will often rely on them to get them um, logistically in the right place to speak to the right people. And Who also is the their fixer ages. and a stringer? Yeah, fixers and stringers. I think generally they need to be credited when it comes to the work of foreign correspondents, because oftentimes foreign correspondents do produce good work. But that work relies on fixers and stringers. So fixers, sorry, just to define what a fixer and a stringer is, they're people who are um, very much locals and they are on the ground. And most of the time they understand the language and they know the right places to go. Um, and they will often direct foreign correspondents to those places and they will help conduct interviews and they will translate the interviews. So it's important to acknowledge that um, foreign correspondents do great work, but oftentimes they have to rely on those local voices and those people who are helping them on the ground. Um, and in terms of what barriers there are, I think for these foreign correspondents who have these uh, linguistic limitations, I would say, the, you're not going to have the same level of authenticity and nuance if you are not um, speaking the same language, if you're not from the same area. And that's often to do with the trust of the person you're speaking to. So you'll find that, you know, if the person knows that you understand uh, what they're experiencing to an extent and, and you understand certain dynamics because you're from that place, that they open up to you in a different way and they will tell you uh, things that you might not um, uh, expect to hear from, um, you know, let's say a foreign correspondent story, uh, because there may be those limitations uh, linguistically. Yes. There might be limitations linguistically. On the other hand, many of these stringers, especially in the, you know, societies like Iraq, S Syria, uh, I'm not sure about Lebanon, but these places, they are watched. 
by governments. Yes. And this oftentimes they had You're to, right. you know, I mean, they, they are directed to a specific source, to a specific people, and then they do not have a free hand of guiding many of those foreign correspondents. Yes, you're absolutely right. And again, that adds to the challenges uh, that I mentioned in the beginning, uh, this idea of being watched. And it's one in one of the chapters by the Syrian uh, correspondent uh, for the BBC, Lina Sinjad. She very much uh, talks about it. She refers to it as breathing fear, this fear that you're constantly being surveilled and everything you're doing um, is being monitored uh, to the extent that it may um, you know, put your life at, at great risk if you say something uh, that you shouldn't be saying or if you speak to someone you shouldn't be speaking to. So this yeah. is absolutely true. Yes. Um, so it's perhaps dangerous and very challenging job uh, for men and women, especially for women. But would you uh, did you find any of these women uh, seek any other profession than uh, reporting on the ground? You mean if they faced uh, risks and then they decided to change their minds? If, no, I mean, I mean, in terms yeah. of uh, attraction towards the job and towards telling the truth, because at least in my yeah. experience, I found that people would, I mean, would stay in the job no matter the cost. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. There are cases in the book. There are several cases in the book where the women could no longer be journalists. They decided that they could no longer be journalists. And I would say this was largely the case um, of women who were mothers uh, and who are mothers and whose families were put at risk um, because they were uh, their journalism uh, was uh, agitating a particular uh, um, governments or non-state actors and therefore once they felt that their lives were at risk that uh, no matter how important their journalism was for their own children's lives to be at risk was a step too far so uh, Hiba Shibani actually a Libyan journalist she specifically discusses how she left Libya uh, for this very reason and she now lives in exile in Malta um, and this theme comes up again and again for the mothers who felt that it was too risky for them to continue doing their their careers and uh, and to have that uh, that constant risk and concern, which is a very legitimate one. Absolutely, very legitimate one. Absolutely. Yeah. So, in the introduction, uh, you are explaining that there is a double burden for being um, uh, self, um, Sahafia. Um, and then you explain and you go into the details. Can you tell us what are those challenges? Yeah, I mean, yes, uh, as, as I mentioned in the beginning, there are several challenges at different at different levels. Um, and I think one of the one of the challenges that I didn't actually touch on to begin with um, is guilt. It's the, the feeling that, um, you know, you, you're always falling short because you are reporting on particular societies whose nuances uh, are impacting people in, in, in such profound, harrowing and traumatic ways that no matter what you do and no matter how you tell the story, you are always going to be uh, reporting from a place of safety compared to the people you are reporting on. So this is one area that I think was actually a uniting theme in the book that all of the women just felt guilty it was not only guilt towards the, the subjects of, of their writing, but also, as I said, if there were members of, a, you know, if, if they have um, children or they're members of a, of a family that doesn't necessarily support their career choices, their lives are being put at risk. There's this constant unending fear, fear of guilt. And then also, of course, there is the trauma that arises from having to report on such harrowing developments in which your mental health is being impacted uh, negatively constantly on a day-to-day -day basis. And uh, stringers and local reporters often don't have the same protections as, let's say, foreign correspondents for big media outlets. Although, of course, those foreign correspondents also suffer some form of trauma. But what I'm trying to say here is when you are reporting and writing about your own homeland, the stakes tend to be much higher because it is a personal story for you. And, you know, Zainal Hayim, who's a Syrian reporter, puts it beautifully. She says, you know, these the, the, the death toll numbers that are rolling on your screens, you know, those numbers 
are my friends, my parents, my lovers, my teachers, my neighbors. You know, these are not just numbers to me. And I think she crystallizes that really beautifully, that this is so personal for these women. So the risks are so much higher and the trauma is so much deeper. Was it personal for you to go after this book? Extremely. It, it, it's. I appreciate you asking me that question. I mean, uh, the story of the Middle East is the story of my uh, of my family. It's the story of my identity. Um, it's the story of who I am today. Uh, I I live and I breathe and I think and I feel the Middle East all the time, even though I live in New York City. Um, so for me. Uh, being able to engage with the women in, in this way, women who I really respect and whose work I had been watching and listening to and reading for many years, and to in many ways understand some of the uh, traumatic uh, ex experiences they, that they had, but also to be a, you know sort of one or two steps removed from it because I wasn't on the ground myself when I was editing this book, it was deeply, deeply personal for me. Um, I mean, a couple of the women uh, I, I became very close to. I'd never met them in person. They looked at me as far more than an editor. I was helping them explore uh, how the reporting that they did impacted them on a personal level. And in some ways, they were coming to terms with some of the trauma that they'd experienced. So I would sometimes wake up to very long street, stream of consciousness emails from um, from a couple of the women where they were opening up to me in a way that they hadn't opened up before. And that created very, very personal bonds for me. And again, it's such a personal story that all of these women are almost like members of my family. You know, it's like we're a tribe and um, and we support each other. Uh, so it was deeply, deeply personal. You had to pick uh, these yeah. 19 women from an, <laughs> an ocean or sea of uh, female reporters. Yeah. What went into your... Um, um, I mean, this uh, idea that who to include and who don't? Yeah, this is such a good question. I agonized over it for many weeks and months. Um, I really wanted a range. I wanted a range of stories. Uh, I wanted, uh, you know, people from all over the region, different nationalities, different generations. Generation was important to me. We have some women um, who are older, and then um, we have some millennial women and much younger women um, at different stages of their career. I wanted women who also um, did different types of journalism. So that would be broadcast journalism, print journalism, radio, so on. Um, and all of that speaks to the diversity. Of course, people have different religious and ethnic backgrounds as well. I mean, given that the region is so diverse, I really wanted to illustrate the diversity of the region through the selection of the women. Uh, and then also, I had in mind, you know, we want to be telling a particular story about the region, but we didn't want it to be focused on one point in time. So, you know, didn't want it to be like an Arab Spring book where everyone's writing about the Arab Spring. And as you will have seen, people write about different eras in, in, in the modern history of the Middle East. So all of these things were factors. I also wanted there to be women who did not live in the Arab world anymore for, um, reasons having to do with being forced into exile or that their families, for example, uh, would have left their homeland. So some of these journalists were born elsewhere because socio-political uh, and economic factors forced their families to leave their homelands. Uh, you know, we've got, for example, Hind Hassan, who's uh, Iraqi and her family uh, left Iraq when she was very young. So I wanted that range because I because I really wanted to choose emphasize that the story of people in that in the diaspora is part of the story of the region because those people are living in the diaspora because they or their families were forced into the diaspora and some of them are refugees of course as we know yes so stay put with me zahra we are talking with zahra hankir author of our i have the book here with me let me figure out this one i have the book with me our women on the ground essays by, by arab women reporting from the arab world it's extraordinary to really understand uh, nations and uh, nation states through the eyes of local people or, or people who 
truly understand issues, social issues, political issues, and especially from the eyes of women. Because oftentimes stories are covered uh, from the male perspective and point of view. And no wonder we have so, too many wars uh, all around the world. But when, when we have this female uh, attitude towards uh, covering the story, we tend to, as uh, Zahra is explaining, we, we tend to have uh, multiple uh, angle and multiple multiple perspective over how the story is unfolding within the community. And especially, you know, as a foreign correspondent, there are so many uh, barriers that many of those uh, meet. So we, we, we just in order to understand, especially Middle East uh, hub for right now after Afghanistan, we are going probably, my assumption is that towards um, a bit tightened situation within the region because of uh, ISIS is uh, perhaps uh, are going to gain power and so forth. But um, to, to just really see what's going on from the multiple perspective of female perspective. And this is what we are discussing here. Uh, this is our fourth season for uh, Peace Minded, the podcast. We are uh, we have a range of amazing uh, writers and and producers, filmmakers. We are talking with uh, Celine Ibrahim with her book about. Um, Quran's interpretation of of a Muslim uh, of women in general, and I'm sure that we are going to have an uh, amazing discussion next week. We are also talking with Sonoraja, um, professor and author of How to Raise a Feminist Son, which I I am I'm so much looking forward to reading the book and talking with Sonora, and also uh, many other writers and guests that uh, we are discussing, mostly uh, women who are are putting forward their body of work. And for us is a, a body of work that connects nations, languages, and, and bridge between people. And that's why we have Zahra here. Okay, um, so do you, I, I'm sure you have criticism over how Western media covers um, Arab words. So what is your criticism? I mean, I really want to emphasize here that I think that a lot of great work is done um, and that a lot of these foreign correspondents uh, are themselves also risking their lives to tell these great stories. And they're also um, telling fascinating stories, too. So I don't want to diminish from that. But I think that generally there there is uh, a lack of, of nuance sometimes in some of that coverage, uh, particularly on the more contentious conflicts such as Palestine and Israel, for example, um, that uh, is telling either a deliberately skewed uh, narrative or a narrative that is wholly incomplete and does not tell the stories um, of victims uh, sufficiently. Uh, so for me, when, I, when I'm when i approaching the work of a foreign correspondent, I often do so with a little bit of hesitation. Uh, I think it's important to read and watch their work, but also more important to seek out the voices of locals. Uh, and if you take, for example, the Afghanistan situation today and the bravery of the women journalists who are there and to think of the challenges that they must be facing, uh, to my mind, that makes it even more important to be watching their work than to be tuning into mainstream media that are covering this conflict that may be sort of a little bit more reductive in their approach to it and not as focused on the local issues and the way that this the situation is unraveling, how that's impacting people locally. So, And that's also an access issue, too. Of course, uh, many foreign correspondents have now left Afghanistan. But a lot of the story of Afghanistan has been incomplete in the years uh, running up to this particular moment in time as well. So there's a lack of holistic understanding there. Uh, and I think uh, it is our responsibility to not only read the work of foreign cor correspondents, but where possible, because obviously there's a linguistic barrier uh, to seek out the work of, uh, of, of, of Afghan journalists who, who also know English and can straddle these two worlds too, sort of Western world and their own world uh, and then act as, as sort of the, the most authentic, I think, messengers as to what's happening on the ground. 
Excellent. So Zahra, let's say that your editor sends you to Afghanistan to cover mm -hmm. a particular story related to women. You do have 19 women in your book. So which one would you pick? You think that can couple with you to produce a, a few very good, meaningful stories? Wow, that is an excellent question. And it's so difficult. But honestly, the person who comes to mind is Aida Alami because uh, she's a formidable journalist, but Aida in particular uh, is attracted to the same sorts of stories that I am uh, when it comes to the stories of victims and, and telling, sort of searching for the most human angle uh, and, and going directly for that human angle and showing empathy and compassion in her writing, but not uh, showing bias. And that's a very, very difficult balance to strike and yeah either comes to mind immediately because either comes done. into your mind immediately yeah. just before yeah. you i was talking with selma dabar author of mm. we wrote in symbols love and lust by arab women writers and this is a book you know uh, of 75 writers and 101 stories and i asked salma so which one is your favorite author or favorite piece and of course she i mean she hesitated to explain um, and i'm sure it's going to be the same with you so if i ask who is your favorite author or favorite story you're uh -huh. going to say all of them you mentioned Ida, but i wonder is is there any particular uh, story or storyline or person that you think um, stands out uh, against them? And of course, you chose 19, so they are already selected. Yeah, definitely. To be very clear, you know, I had very different reactions to each piece, uh, and I thought they were all fantastic. Um, so I'm obviously not speaking of my favorite author here, but certainly um, uh, Lina Atallah's piece. Uh, a, a belated encounter uh, with gender. Um, Tell me about the piece. Her, do you remember? Yes, of course I do. And it's a, it's really so. She wrote the piece on her father's deathbed bed as he was dying, um, and she had a very complicated relationship with her father uh, that is almost like an extension of her relationship with the state because essentially it's a relationship with patriarchy. Um, he was a very patriarchal man. She writes about this in the opening of her book in the most beautiful way possible. Um, she recalls memories of her as a child, you know, believing that he's going to show her the utmost protection and then realizing as she grew older um, that he was restricting her from, from pursuing certain dreams um, and, way, and a way of life. And then um, how that impacted her career, her relationship with her gender and um, the things that she focused on in her career, and then ultimately when he dies, how she finds some peace um, in her understanding of her relationship with her father. And to me, that's very, very relatable. I have a similar relationship with my father um, in which he uh, is very was very strict with me when I was growing up, um, and, and it was a problematic relationship which of course changed with age as I matured, but then that sort of mirroring the relationship with the state or perhaps in, in my situation, more religion um, and Islam. So I, you know, finding, finding some peace in that situation um, as you come of age and as you grow older and as your parents grow older and then how that relates to your own work was very relatable to me and I found to be quite beautifully articulated by her. And it's a situation that many, women, I think, experience uh, across the Middle East to this perhaps problematic, uh, not problematic, but very layered relationship with their father. So I, I found that to be just a beautiful expression of love and growth and coming of age. Excellent. Beautifully put. Zahra, um, are you working on any project right now? Yeah, so I'm actually writing a book um, with the same publisher. So it, it'll be out in 2023 on the uh, social and cultural history of eyeliner, which I'm wearing right now. Um, it sounds quite different as a subject, of course, um, but I do love cultural histories and I love surprising and delightful stories around specific objects. So the object really is just for me a vehicle into telling stories around how this object has been used in different parts of the world, different communities in different countries across the centuries, starting with Nefertiti in ancient Egypt, and then bringing us to the modern day. I'm going to be traveling to places like Japan and India and Chad 
and Iran to tell the stories of how eyeliner has been used in very specific ways in, in those communities that are quite beautiful um, cultural practices. And in doing so, to try to amplify the contributions of people of color to the beauty industry, which I'm sure many listeners know, it tends to be quite white dominant and Eurocentric whilst culturally appropriating uh, certain aspects of brown and black beauty. Um, so I'm touching on that as well. Uh, so while on the surface it might seem to be slightly frivolous and trivial, it's actually a very surprisingly pr profound uh, book. And I'm just loving the research so far that I've been doing. I'm going to Chad next month to spend a week in the desert with a tribe. <laughs> so it's it's been an absolute delight so far. And and uh, and, and I hope that it, people will, will learn surprising um, and delightful things from the book. Yes. As you're speaking and explaining the book, I'm thinking about sometimes in some of the cultures and tribes, uh, women have, uh, they, they, they only have their eyes as, a, yeah. as a, you know, um, like um, a countenance of beauty to just show. And then Absolutely. what would you do with the, <laughs> with the eye? So you, you, you just make it as beautiful as you can. Absolutely. And it's also, it's also beyond aesthetics in many communities. So it uh -huh. also has a spiritual meaning. It has a medicinal meaning. I mean, actually in Afghanistan, for example, men and women wear it in, in across the Arab world. Um, men wear it as well. In, in some parts of Asia, eyeliner is smeared onto the eyes of babies. So there are some quite fascinating cultural practices which I will yes. be touching on that go that go beyond beauty and aesthetics. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I yeah. remember I was a child and my grandma, they they, they called it sorme. So my yes, grandma, of course, sorme. Yes. Yeah. and then they would just put it inside uh, our eyes and saying that, oh, this yeah. is gonna um, make you uh, make your eyes to be um, in um, more focused or more yeah. um, this kind of thing. So yeah, medis medicine medicinal that says also I, I, I can't wait to read <laughs> oh thank you I'm, I'm happy to hear that yes yes um you're an editor so what do you do other than um doing I mean, writing books uh, I mean I'm a freelance writer so uh I often do work on the side uh, freelance work so longer form work um I've done some translation um, I do have a day job, uh, which is in news curation, so I curate news. Um, so pretty much what I do is uh, always related to news, but I'm using different parts of my, <laughs> of my brain. So I'm either writing or producing it, um, or I'm curating it. Uh, but I, you know, it's, it's just, it's part of my career. So when I say what I do, I, I tend to say that I'm a, I'm a journalist or I'm an editor. Um, but that's that's pretty much um, excellent. Pretty excellent. Much it. It's constant. So, yeah, constant. So, uh, yeah. In, in a few sentences or words, what is your impression of what's going on in Afghanistan? It's just your your heartfelt felt impression that I would like to know. I think it's absolutely tragic. Uh, you know, I'm I, I'm not going to be um, expressing political views here. I do think that the withdrawal was problematic. Um, I think it would have been uh, difficult no matter what. Um, I obviously didn't think that the war went on for too long um, and that there should have been a, um, a transition plan in place uh, that would have um, protected um, Afghans uh, in, in a way that they're not uh, seeing um, currently. Uh, um, and it's tragic to see that this will cause a, a refugee crisis um, and then uh, that not everybody will be able to leave. Uh, some people will have to stay and experience, um, uh, the women in particular experience uh, uh, re repression. Um, uh, so, I mean, I, I, I think it's, uh, it's, it's tragic, really. That's, that's the, the one word that I would say. I think, you know, Western interventionism um, oftentimes ends quite Body. Absolutely. You ask me. <laughs> so it was Iran, Iran coup d'etat, then it was yeah. Iraq invasion, then we had Syrian invasion, and then this importing yeah. democracy to all over the world. Yes, I, I get it. So uh, if you ought to see 
um, let's say that in an imaginary world, because I don't think that's going to ever happen. But mm -hmm. in an imaginary world, um, we uh, we see some very good, meaningful stories about Arab women in the Middle East. So, what uh, what anecdote or what uh, inscription those kind of stories, in your opinion, should have or must have? I mean, I think the hallmarks of a good story um, on Arab women would be that you are speaking to them rather than speaking over them, um, that you are actually uh, learning what their main issues are and then um, reporting on them from there rather than coming at the story um, with a particular angle already in mind. Um, so for me, you know, I think one of the anecdotes in the book that I found to be really compelling was Zainal Hayim mentioning that she um, entered a Syrian gynecological clinic. Uh, and that's not sort of an obvious story that you would go to, but she was telling the stories of the women in that clinic. Um, and then also with Hiba Shibani in Libya, where she was, you know, during um, the, the very, very complex situation there, she was turning her attention to, um, issues that were perhaps not on the top of the news agenda, such as Libyan women not being able to give their nationality to their children, um, which is highly problematic if they're married to a foreigner. So these are the sorts of stories that I find compelling where they're not obvious, but you know because you speak to the women and because perhaps you are of the society that you know that these are um, crucial issues in that society. Um, you know, it might be in a place like Lebanon right now, like violence against women, domestic violence, for example, may not be an obvious story right now, given that the country is, has essentially fallen apart. But these are the sorts of things that I look for. Um, you know, you have broader developments impacting people, but what is specifically impacting women on a day-to-day -day basis that, that um, would be illuminating? And oftentimes I found that usually women write these stories and not men. Yeah. yeah, I mean, they're considered quote unquote women's issues. And obviously I hate that term because they're people yeah, issues. Um, <laughs> so uh, you're absolutely right that they are, um, they're not the, the first, the first um, uh, story that let's say specifically foreign correspondents would, would go to. I think it's much more likely from, from a local because they're well versed in these difficulties. So that's what I personally would look for, or I just go beyond the big headlines and I'd want to, to, to sort of zero in on those struggles. Excellent. Uh, Zahra, I didn't prep you for this question, but I, mm -hmm. I wonder if you have any passage or any, uh, any paragraph in the book that you are interested in and would like to read for us. Yeah, absolutely. If you just give me a moment to, to bring yes, it up. I'll, I'll give you. I'll give you a um, moment. Yes, we are talking with Zahra Hankir, author of "Our Women on the Ground: Essays by Arab Women Reporting from the Arab World," uh, the story of. Arab women uh, from a um, female editor and for women. And honestly, this this uh, book is not only for women because I found um, very intriguing to understand issues and situations that is been described and explained um, for the public and for people from the women's perspective. And I mean, I, I, I do have a bias. I, I admit I do have a bias, but at least I found when women write stories and tell, tell stories, um, they, they touch upon some of the um, uh, I mean, issues and angles and go from uh, pursuing this story that makes it softer makes it uh, more interesting yes um so then i think uh, that's worthwhile to uh, to look at these and it's not a woman book it's a book about arab nation that we can learn a great deal okay zahra so i'll, I'll leave it to you to read us a few few lines of your book sure so this is from Asma al Ghul's essay. She's a Palestinian journalist, and the title is Between the Explosions. This was translated from Arabic. Um, and this is actually quite a, a difficult couple of passages. So I'm just flagging that to listeners in case um, they, might find, they may find it triggering. Um, it touches on death. Um, 
As soon as we entered Rafah, we watched a plane shelling the home of a local family, the Abu Tahas. We went to the Kuwaiti hospital straight away, where we witnessed some family members carry in the dead and wounded. Among them was a tiny baby dressed in pink. I went into a room and saw people lining up the dead bodies. Everything in that scene pointed to the fact that those corpses had been alive just moments earlier. Their clothes, the position of their bodies, and their white feet. I thought that if I talked to them, they would talk back. I recognized the baby from moments earlier. He was dead. His name was Riz Abu Taha. I went into another room where a distraught and hysterical mother was wailing. She asked if I had come across a baby dressed in pink, the dead baby on the floor that I had just seen. She didn't know he was dead and everyone was hiding the tragedy from her intentionally. She held me as if she knew I wouldn't lie to her begging me to tell her the truth as she sobbed. I couldn't lie, because if it were me, I wouldn't want to be lied to. When I told her that her child was among the dead, the woman collapsed, and so too did my role as a journalist. In those very moments, I acted beyond my role as a journalist. I acted like a mother. The woman held me tight, not believing what I had just said screaming and asking me again and again if it was true. The child was her firstborn. She held her breasts and wailed, what will I do with these now, referring to her breast milk. Yes, it was. It is beautiful. It was beautiful when I was reading it and I had a goosebump. Um, the Middle East is the area of non-stop wars but we are not going to end with war <laughs> for the sake of our program and our show I, I i i i'm hoping for peace and i'm hoping for i mean establishing peace somehow in the middle east god knows when but uh, the um, signature of our show is to end the program by sharing something statement prayer childhood story about peace kindness and compassion and i wonder what you have to tell us what you have uh, yeah sure so so in the aftermath of the beirut blast uh, i met um a survivor who had lost his home. Um, he was homeless, he had nothing. Um, and I befriended him. He was an older man in his 60s. And um, we used to speak regularly and I would check up on him at the beginning. And then actually he ended up towards the end of our friendship um, calling me every day and asking me how I was doing and concerned about my well-being and showing me the most incredible kindness and compassion that I had not experienced in a long while, that kind of selflessness where somebody is going through their own deeply problematic and traumatic and harrowing experience and they still show other people care and kindness. And uh, that changed me, that changed me. Um, and, I, and I share his story, his name was Eli Halabi, because he ended up passing away from COVID-19 him, himself and um, still every single day until the day he passed away he checked up on me and I just really want to share his story to show that that sort of compassion and love and kindness can can be universal really um, no matter what people are going through some people Excellent. really have it within them I hope that's appropriate as a story. Um, it's absolutely. So you said that it changed you in what way? Yeah. It made me a lot more sensitive to um, understanding that everyone has their own struggles. And even if you are struggling yourself, you should always show kindness and thoughtfulness and compassion to other people as well. Um, sometimes it's difficult depending on what people are going through, but the world has become very noisy and cluttered and it's easy to forget that this kind of basic checking up on people and showing them care is fundamental to um to keeping hope you know to being hopeful and yeah. uh, and that's something i carry with me now he he did really change me 
Yeah, excellent, excellent. And in order to change some of our perspective about what's going on in the Arab world, our women on the ground essays by Arab women reporting from the Arab world by Zahra Hanke. Thank you so much, Zahra. It was a pleasure talking with you. Thank you so much for having me. This was so much um, fun. It was really enjoyable. Thank sure, you. thank you. And Khoda Hafiz.